You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. This is the CRM Archaeology Podcast. It's the show where we pull back the veil of cultural resources management archaeology and discuss the issues that everyone is concerned about. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 162 for April 24th, 2019. I'm your sore-throated host, Chris Webster. On today's show, we talk about career monitors and a need for training. So study up on those rusty skills because you never know when you're going to need them and because the CRM Archaeology Podcast starts right now. Welcome to the show, everyone. Joining me today is Bill in California. Good morning. And Stephen in Calgary. Hi. So as I sort of briefly alluded to in the introduction, I just woke up this morning with a horrible sore throat. So we'll see how long this lasts for me uh, doing all this talking. Hopefully these guys can can do a lot of talking too. But uh, one of the reasons why I probably have a sore throat is because I've been moving all around and doing a bunch of traveling and I'm, I'm actually on a three-week project down here in Southern California and between field work and then flying up to San Francisco and then we did an evening sailboat trip with my friend who got us back at about 1 a.m. in the morning uh, in the cold so that probably wasn't good for my throat and then you know just airline travel and then driving out here to um, back to uh, Arizona uh, to continue working on this project this week. I don't know. I think it all just caught up to me. So I got a sore throat. And that's one of the quality of life issues that I think we'll be discussing probably later on in this show if we get to it. But one of the other things that this project and being down here has brought up for me is really thinking about the issue of monitoring. And we've talked about monitoring on this show before. And I've talked extensively to other people, just anybody who will listen, about monitoring and how it's not given the credit that it's due because monitoring is seen as uh, something for the rookies to do. It's seen for sort of new, new people, people that don't have as much training. It's seen for people who are uh, maybe new at your company. I don't know, but but new is generally the word applied to monitors. And Southern California is is having a growing problem where, and I, I learned this just talking to some of the people that are, that are on the crew down here because they're agreeing with this, but What's going on is Southern California is doing a lot of construction. They've done a lot of archaeology down here already, but they've also done a lot of doing a lot of construction. And now all those places where that archaeology has been done are being monitored. And that's partly because of the California laws and regulations that state, you know, you have to do that in X circumstance. And a lot of states have those regulations. But California in particular seems to be a lot more heavy with it. So a lot of people down here whether they're new or not, are ending up monitoring just to just to keep working. And before too long, they're losing a lot of those skills based around uh, site recording. And I think that's just becoming uh, a bigger and bigger problem. And that's just, you know, the guys on the crew down here talking about that. I didn't come from Southern California, but most of them, uh, while they don't necessarily live down here, they've done a lot of work down here. And they're agreeing that, that the monitoring problem is pretty huge. So I want to know you guys from... Uh, crew chief, project manager standpoint, you know, have you always also thought, cause I, I've always thought the same thing too, is, you know, people send the monitors out, they, they send new people out to monitor. So, you know, what are your thoughts on, uh, we'll start with you, Bill, what, because we were talking about this before we started. What are your thoughts on, on that? I mean, is that true? And is that in your experience? What's, what's actually happened? Sure. Uh, well, you know, I, as I was mentioning before, um, one time, a long time ago, I went to a Northwest Northwest Anthropological Conference session, and it was talking about uh, work in the North, uh, Pacific Northwest, specifically mm-hmm. the Northwest Coast. And um, several of the people in there uh, gave talks about what we know about paleo in the Northwest, but also just kind of you know strategies for us to find more paleo sites. And the monitoring issue came up in one presenter's discussion. And I remember her, I, I can't even remember which conference this was, but I remember specifically her saying that ideally we would mix up the monitors so that sometimes it's the new folks they go out there with another individual trained on what to look for and everything. And then that person might stay only half a day and then they come back. And then the new person would work for a little bit of time uh, because it's not just identifying stuff. It's also knowing how to handle yourself in a construction site. And if you're new with, with that whole thing, you may not know what you can and can't do. And so you might end up seeing stuff and then you just convince yourself it's nothing because it's really easy for the, the construction folks to convince you to not, 
tell them to stop. But that's a whole other issue. The the identifying sites thing, though, is what they were focusing on. I remember her specifically saying that in the, it would be good to have m- new monitors go out with someone for half a day or so, and then they spend three days or whatever monitoring, and then someone else on the crew would get switched out and that you'd have another tech that maybe has a little bit more experience or even just a crew chief, if they don't have something to do, do some of the monitoring and then it would go back and forth. Now, this mm-hmm. is going to work for, uh, you know, monitoring projects where there's multiple days, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not going to work if it's just an afternoon of them fixing a storm drain or something like that. And all I have to do is just dig down. I mean, that's a few hours worth of excavation and it's not even a full day. But the idea is that folks would get rotated in and out. Not only would people who think they know what they're doing see more dirt and see more situations in more environments, but people who actually, uh, uh, you know, are at the lower end of the the, uh, company's uh, hierarchy or whatever, wouldn't just spend all their time doing monitoring. They'd be out surveying. They'd be, uh, you know, looking at artifacts and stuff. They'd be excavating whenever that happens. And they wouldn't just be stuck watching a backhoe for the whole time. Well, that's that's the idea. And down, that's the, one of the big problems, too, is down here in Southern California, it's not just usually just for a day. Sometimes it's for months and months and months. You know, there's projects that are ongoing that are, you know, several years. They've got a whole fleet of monitors out there and, and people just making a career out of doing that. One of the gentlemen on this crew is, uh, you know, he's he's been doing this for probably 20 years. And he said he's getting older and he's specifically looking for monitoring jobs, which, you know, that's great. I mean, if you are going to stick with monitoring work, then there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's actually, uh, you know, usually good, decent paying work if you can get it. But the problem is, is the treatment of companies of these monitors and and they don't get enough ongoing training. Um, they don't get enough uh, of a sense of responsibility for what they're actually doing out there. I think in a lot of cases, they're just yeah. seen as the the person that's out there and they don't really even know what their responsibilities are, to be honest, because if I meet people that, really don't know how to do site recording or know how to use, in, in California's case, how to use the California DPR forms. Well, how are you supposed to monitor? If you're the field tech crew chief and project manager and field director all wrapped up in one, then you, you have to know how to do that stuff unless their procedure, and I don't know about this, but unless their procedure is if they see something, and that is a whole other training issue, train, train to actually see something. But if they see something, stopping the construction and then basically calling the office and they send somebody out that knows what they're doing. Maybe that's what the case. I actually don't even know. I have to think that that probably is the case in a lot of, in a lot of situations because otherwise you'd know how to record a site, you know, Steven. Yeah. Can, can we back up for a moment? Um, Cause sure. not every place does this sort of thing. So when you're talking about monitoring, are, are you like, wh- where are you in the process? Is this like a, high potential area that where nothing was found? Is this an area where like a site got excavated, but you're kind of holding out that maybe there's something more there or what's, what's the situation? What, when is monitoring called for? I think it's both. Um, it's, there are sites in the area and you're monitoring, you flagged them off. You're making sure the bulldozers don't come near them. Uh, because even if they're flagged off or even if they know where they're at, you know, people still bulldoze over stuff. It's happened before. And then it's also, uh, it's possible that that particular area, nothing was found. Like there's no actual sites where they're at, but it is a high potential for subsurface discoveries for one reason or another. California is super hyper sensitive about subsurface discovery. Even if we're doing pedestrian survey all over the place, if we find a bunch of sites over here, but over on the other side, we didn't find a bunch of sites. They're like, well, let's send a monitor out anyway. Um, and part of that is the tribal involvement um, because the tribes are, are keeping on the agencies and saying, Hey, we want you to be hypersensitive of all the possible subsurface stuff. So not only are there archaeological monitors, but there's also tribal monitors, you know, just making sure the (laughs) the archaeologists and everybody else are keeping on their toes. Um, So there's a lot of monitoring going on. And in Southern California, there's often a paleontological monitor and a biological monitor as well. So you've got all these monitors and they all have to know what the heck they're doing. So I hope that answers your question, Stephen. Yeah, well, and and in that case, I would think like if it's the situation where um, sites had been found in the area and mm-hmm. you're, you're just keeping an eye out for something more. Right. I would think that, you know, one, one of the better qualifications for being the monitor is that you were involved with the earlier work. Oh yeah. You would think, but that never happens in CRM. Like for example, if a, if a site goes all the way to the excavation stage, I mean, that's like two or three different proposal scenarios and maybe only the people in the office were familiar with the previous work, you know, in CRM. I mean, 
whoever did the survey is probably long gone. Maybe it was even done years ago. You know what I mean? So uh, the fact that the monitor is the, the the likelihood of the monitor being connected to the previous survey that was done, I think, is is uh, is a long shot in that case. Sure. But, you know, I mean, at the same time, It'd be nice. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I mean, presumably they're at least handed, you know, like, here's a copy of the report. Uh, yeah. Something that they don't have that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they should. I mean, they should. You're right. They're, well, how could how could they not get a copy? Like, <laughs> yeah. If, well, I mean, if, if monitoring is required and it's required by by the shippo, why isn't the mm-hmm. shippo submitting that is like prior work? Why why can't I get a copy of the report? Oh, the company has a copy of the report. I'm certain of it. But monitors are field technicians, okay? And field technicians yeah. are rarely even told what the project is for. Yeah, but I'm, I'm with Stephen on this. That this is a workflow issue, right? Especially in yeah. the age of cell phones that that they don't have a PDF of the report on their phone. I mean, I I used to make as many things available. There were some field techs who I honestly didn't even want the information, but right. I would try to make the, you know, scope of work available if it, especially if it didn't have the prices and stuff on it. Um, I would try to make as many previously existing reports available. Sometimes if I was in a situation where they had printed off a lot of those reports or whatever, or we had paper copies, I'd borrow those ones from the office and bring them out there so mm-hmm. that folks could see artifacts, you know, especially copying off pictures of the artifacts that we're supposed to be looking for, uh, pictures of the previous projects where their excavations were, the maps and stuff like that, so that folks would be able to figure things out. And like towards the end of uh, doing CRM, I used to get the project area turned into a KMZ file and folks could have it on their Google Earth if you had reception I mean, I, I kept open a Dropbox folder uh, that folks could just share freely of the project records, right? Like all the things that I was supposed to do, because the idea was always that something could easily happen to me and I'm not in the same area or even to, on the project or whatever, but mm-hmm. I want the thing to keep moving forward. And not only that, but it, I think that especially in the case of doing something like monitoring where hours can grind by and nothing ends up happening. You've got those reports. You can see the excavations that other companies have done and the awesome stuff that's there. And, you know, and if it's a decent report, you know, you can see a lot of information about what's going on in that area, different times, you know, historically prehistoric mm-hmm. and stuff. A lot of times reading those reports, it gives text an idea of how a report's even supposed to go. And when you're stuck in a, truck or just monitoring or you know yeah. waiting waiting the eons that it takes for them to do the next step in the construction process i mean if you've got that thing on your phone it's sweet i remember people would sit there and read the reports uh sitting cross-legged on the ground while they move the next pipe into place and all this other stuff that they didn't actually in fact need the archaeologists there and a lot of folks learned a lot about especially in arizona where there was huge sites and excavations they'd learn a lot about prehistory that they didn't know before i think we're getting a little bit off track here because i don't disagree with you guys at all and i hope i hope i didn't come across that way i'm just trying to state what it looks like the situation actually is i think i think uh people are they must be given i'm I'm just giving companies the benefit of the doubt here um but they must be given the site records because if there are previously recorded sites in the area that you're actually having to watch out for you, you better damn well know where they're at <laughs> and, and you and you probably have them on a trimble too in, in a best case scenario because you have to know where the things are to have the cru- the crews avoid them and i and i get all that um and and it's probably also possible that that techs are actually reading the site records and they're reading the report if they're given the report maybe it's in a you know a cloud drive or something like that but i just don't think the importance of their job and uh and maybe even the pi or whoever the the person in charge of this project is back in the office should say hey you're going out to monitor next week i want you to spend a couple hours today you can bill it to the project i want you to read the report you know you don't have to read the whole thing but read the analysis section read the sites that were found read read what's out there and be familiar with it and then maybe even quiz them on a little bit before they go out there i don't know bill i also wonder if is, is so is monitoring an actual just straight up position though yeah, that's either, you know, at the tech level or something like that. And that, you know, there's individuals who are just only monitors that never dig, they never write, they never record anything. All they do is just stand there with their phone and a camera and a tremble, like yeah. waiting to see a site. So that this is this is the person I'm talking about. But they're not considered field techs that would do all the other stuff. No, they they are. I think in the in the parlance of the terms, they're they're field techs, you know, for all intents and purposes. That's what their job is. They're a field technician. However, 
they're not a field tech in the sense of being on a crew and actually doing site recording. They're 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 monitors. They're career monitors. And I don't I don't know that we have yeah. actually I've never seen a job posting or something that says says we need somebody for monitoring, but it's like we're hiring a field technician <laughs> to be a monitor. You know what I mean? Like monitor doesn't seem to be a position. <laughs> well, yeah, but so what you're describing is it sounds like this is a career position. It is. Because down here. I, I I know that everywhere else I've ever worked or lived did CRM, if someone said all I want to do is purely monitor for this company. They'd be like, okay, well, you're going to have to switch companies. I mean, you can make a career that way, but yeah. you're not going to be able to just work here because, you know, monitoring is one thing we do. And then excavation and survey is another thing we do, uh, you mm-hmm. know, and re- report writing and, and archival and artifact analysis. So there's many different things to do. And we don't just have our techs only standing out in the forest in the rain watching a backhoe or, you know, just like we don't have. I mean, there may be years or whatever where a tech ends up surveying constantly for 12 straight months because that was the work that they just ended up being the one who draws this, the straw that's just surveying. Or the yeah. company never gets an excavation project. Uh, they could also probably end up doing extensive monitoring many, many months in a row without going out to do any survey or anything like that. Just that's the way that the cookie crumbles. But I've never heard of a situation where it's just individuals are hired purely to monitor. Yeah. Yeah, well, they're you know they're they're hired just like any other temporary shovel bump position. They're probably not. I I'm I'm saying probably, but I think there are pro- companies in Southern California that are that have transitioned to be almost purely monitoring. Right? They hardly do any survey anymore. They're just getting these huge projects from you know through PG and E and some other stuff where uh, they've got massive transmission lines or remediation projects, something like that, where all they're doing is monitoring. And before they knew it. They're not really doing archaeology anymore. They're just hiring monitors and and just you know moving on down the line and, and doing that. So it's a it's an interesting problem. I, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. Like I, I and and I I disagree with the notion that they're not doing archaeology anymore. This this is a type of archaeology, right? Like they're monitoring. They have to run out there, record something. If if they see it, they have to be able to recognize it while they're in the field. You know, but that's but full stop, Stephen. That's where I'm talking about. That is the problem. They don't know how to do that. They're not being trained to recognize something and record it. I'm not saying it's not archaeology. They're just not being trained to actually do more archaeology like they're supposed to. That's their job when they find stuff and they don't know how to do it. So what happens when they find stuff then? I don't know. They must call somebody or it go, or falls through the cracks, you know, and, and who's to say they're even finding everything because they don't understand even what they're looking for because they've been monitors their whole lives and they haven't been trained, you know, let's, uh, Let's pick up training and and the rest of this discussion on the other side of the break, uh, because we're going to come back and talk about this in segment two. And we're right up against that right now. So we'll be back in just a second. This is Chris Webster. You're listening to this ad right now on the CRM Archaeology podcast, which means you're either a fan of contract archaeology, you are an archaeologist, or maybe you're somebody in a position to run a company or something like that. Well, If you're hearing this, then other people could be hearing this as well. Uh, I want to talk about Archaeology Podcast Network advertising and sponsorship. Put your message right here. Um, Very soon, this show is going to be on a new platform where you'll be able to do dynamic advertising, which means you can drop an ad right now for one episode that's current. And you can just put the ad up there and whatever episode somebody listens to, even if it's one from six years ago, they will hear your current ad. And it's going to be $150 for 30 seconds. You could do that right now for a long-term ad, something that has um, what we call a long tail or something like that, where or it's evergreen, which means if you put an ad up, say, for your company, your general services, then people could go there and hear it. We get about five to 7,000 listeners to this podcast every month. And... That's quite a bit. So 150 bucks for 30 seconds. If you want to put an ad on every single show of the RKLJ Podcast Network for one month, uh, and we're adding one new show here in May and another one probably in June, I'm not going to increase the pricing, but it's $1,000 a month. And that gets your ad in front of 140,000 ears. If you do the whole year, I'll knock off two months, and that's 1.4 million listens to your ad. So consider it. Podcast advertising is real and it works because you're listening to this right now. And that's all the proof you need. All right. This has been Chris Webster with the Archaeology Podcast Network. Check it out at arcpodnet.com forward slash ads. And now back to the show. All 
All right, welcome back to episode 162 of the CRM Archaeology Podcast, and we're talking about monitoring. And we, we left off that last segment talking about, um, well, kind of leading into a discussion about training and, and people and, and really a lack of training. And I, I kicked off the segment by saying, you know, a lot of times new people are sent out to do this and they, they just they, they didn't have the training to begin with. They're new. And so they're sent out to monitor. But I'm wondering, trying to kind of flip this a little bit. What, do, what kind of training do you think, um, do you guys think that companies could or should provide? Because it would all be overhead. It would purely be overhead if they're going to do any training on this stuff. So keep that in mind from a cost standpoint, Stephen. Well, I, I kind of want to step back first um, sure. and, and toss this in here. Because uh, if we're going to do monitoring here in Alberta, it's, it's a permitted activity, which means that mm-hmm. the person on site is the permit holder. Or... Yeah. Uh, I think it's 80% on site, but the, the permit holder has to be here. And to be a permit holder, you know, you are a full, you know, Secretary of the Interior qualified level of uh, archaeologist. So yeah. it's, it's, you've got a grad degree, you've got, um, you know, years of experience. You, you're, you know, you do other archaeological stuff, presumably, but you don't have to. Like, if, if that was your entire career is that you were just pulling monitoring permits, you know, so be it. Um, I, I can't imagine how that would possibly happen, but <laughs> you know, like, like it could be a thing and, and, mm-hmm. you know, and that's fine. I mean, you still have to do a report, you still have to do uh site forms. You still have to, you know, collect artifacts as necessary, you know, whatever. Um, it's, it's just the, the circumstances of, uh, uncovering the materials is, is, is different. So, so from that perspective, um, the training you should have is you should be a qualified archeologist. Sure you know, a uh, full stop. But, you know, if, if you're talking about like, you know, if, if there's multiple things going on and you have the, the uh, you know, principal investigator and uh, they're, you know, working with, you know, a small crew, you know, kind of spread out to see things from different angles or you know, whatever, then I would presume that, you know, the monitoring would include like, you know, a history of the projects in the area, you know, like, why are you there? Um, you mm-hmm. know, and, and what can you expect to find? And I mean, cause presumably if you're there, you're there because people have found stuff in similar circumstances before. Right. So you should be covering that. You should be covering, I mean, t- to a certain extent, everybody should be able to identify the, the types of artifacts in, in the area. And, and, you know, like if it's helpful, um, and I haven't done this for archaeological monitors, but I've done this for construction people, uh, construction workers, is you basically build up a set of flashcards of, you know, popular artifact types. Mm-hmm. You know, so sort of like, I, th- I think that might be a, you know, something, and, you know, they can flip through the card and, and be familiar visually with, you know, the sorts of right. stuff we're talking about. Um, I can't see why you, you couldn't do something similar for, you know, um, less experienced uh, field technicians or something like that. And, and I mean, sure. you, well, how, I can't see how that would be that much different from the training that you normally give your field techs. Like, um, you know, being able to identify, you know, archaeological materials kind of, that, that's, that's a full field tech sort of skill set. Right. So um, what, what kind of, when you're bringing someone on for a phase one or, you know, a survey or um, impact mm-hmm. assessment or whatever you want to call it, what are you you know, what kind of training are you, are you giving them to make sure that they know how to do their job? Are, are you just relying on, on, on some poor university? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> you're right. You definitely don't rely on me, man. Definitely don't do that. You're, you're presuming Steven that, uh, that there even is training when somebody gets to a job, they're usually hired. They show up the night before, uh, to the hotel room or wherever they're going. And then their boots on the ground the next day, you know, there's no, there's no training. You know how many jobs I've had where where I wasn't the person in charge um, before I started doing all that stuff, where you just show up and if I hadn't actually asked the questions in my, um, you know, when they called me to offer the job, if I hadn't asked questions about the project, I would never have known what we were even possibly finding. They're just calling up to say, hey, CV looks good. Uh, when can you start? You know, we start on this date. Can you be there? And And that's it. Same thing with the project I'm on now. Um, you know, people, none of us met each other. There was a conference call a few weeks ago, but none of us got to speak. It was basically just, uh, that's where we did find out what the project was actually for 
but we didn't know what kinds of stuff we would find. You know, I've only worked down in this area once before. We did a 15,000 acre survey four years ago, but that's it for me. Other than that, I don't know any of the regional typologies for the projectile points. Um, I don't know what any of the pottery is called. I can describe it. I'm really good at description, but I don't know the names for any of this stuff. And well, But that's that comes later. Um, but that, exactly. You, yeah. You, you, I don't, for a field tech, a field tech is, shouldn't, isn't necessarily required to know like all the types and, and, and stuff like that. They should just be able to say like, Hey, it's a bone and it looks like it's been cut or, you know, this, this is clearly chip stone or, you know, like, like can, can they identify an artifact? Like we're, we're not getting into like analysis. You know, well, we are we are a little bit. We are a little bit, especially when it comes to historics, because if you don't understand what in period 1960s historics are and and then before that, because we don't collect anything. So we're making um, essentially somebody's making eligibility determinations based on what we describe. So oh if you don't understand God. what you're looking at. Yeah, see, then, I, I don't necessarily agree with that as a method. Uh, well, that, that's how it's done down here, though. Well, also workflow, too. I mean... So, yeah, like towards the end, I also started having monitors, if they called me, take a video of it and send it to me on sure. your phone. What is the backhoe doing? What is that? Mm -hmm. Can you use your phone to show me that thing? Like send it to me in real time. This isn't going to work if you're way out there and stuff. But, I mean, 80% of the monitoring is happening where you have cell reception. So if you didn't know what that can was, photo it really good and then send me the picture. And within seconds, I can probably tell you if that's historical or not. Yeah, that's one. That's one of the reasons I'm out on this project is to be. Uh, um, they're using WildNote from an archaeological standpoint for the first time, and they've used WildNote for biology and stuff before. But this is the first time this company's used it for archaeology, so they had me come down just to kind of train the crew up. And it turns out I'm you know working on the crew for the whole three weeks that I'm down here. But the reason I'm saying that is because that is one advantage to this is the project manager who's actually not an archaeologist. Um, the project manager has training in project management and uh, that person needs to be able to see stuff that we're doing in real time. And since we have service, we're able to uh, send those things off and put them in the system. And then the other people back at the office that may know what something is, they can instantly see that once we sync. So that is, a, that is kind of a handy deal. You're right, Bill. Um, to be able to do that in real time. But then again, a lot of monitoring, you know, doesn't necessarily happen in those sorts of circumstances. They do down here in California, but. Yeah. I, I still answer artifact questions for folks in the field. Yeah. I mean, they, they know that I'm not in the field most of the time. So I'm definitely a reliable person that can get on my computer and within seconds, send you articles on that bottle and all kinds of stuff. I did that with Twitter years ago. I had a bottle. I didn't know. I didn't understand. Oh, like, yeah. I put a picture up on uh, Twitter of a bottle base and I was like, what the hell is this? It looks close to being in period, but I don't actually recognize it and I can't get to my resources. And, and before I had them all on my, on my devices and I had a Twitter response within five minutes, I had a bunch of them and a reference in the past so the flashcard thing is definitely, I don't know about the flashcards, but we would take the photos of other um, other reports where they had found artif artifacts and then print those off and make a little handbook for the construction company. And also, you know, like I was saying about making the actual reports, I worked for supervisors who they wanted me to actually have read those reports. So it doesn't matter if you got there the day before or if you got there, whatever, within one day you were supposed to have skimmed and know what was in those reports and know what kind of sites are nearby and how the timetables break down and when, you know, historical period things happened and all that different stuff. I mean, the, I don't know about being quizzed, but it was kind of like your supervisor, if they asked you questions and you didn't know the answer is kind of like you're moving closer to never working here again. Yeah. So if you're not reading the materials that I'm sending you, the flashcards and the stuff, the printouts were really for the, uh, uh, construction kind of the head person really mm -hmm. but we always made sure there was enough copies for anyone on there that wanted to see and then the other second thing was a little blurb they always had about this is against the law for you to rip sites and steal things and like here are all the requirements so if you think that you're just going to go out tomorrow and go and find a site and then find these arrowheads like here's the actual penalty and here's like what what in the state of washington or arizona here's what will happen to you so it was always like teaching and then you know, don't use this stuff directly to go out and loot sites that you guys know about. But here are the artifacts. And here's the reason why this person's here, not just because they want to suck down some of your payroll, but because they're actually, you know, helping you stay out of trouble from getting sued. Right. So that was one whole half of it. But the other half was 
especially when I was first monitoring, especially in Washington where I didn't really know anything and they were sending me on historical sites. So that was a bit easier because I had already seen quite a few historical sites. My master's was on historical archaeology. So they had to fill in the gap between prehistory, which is massive. I mean, if you're used to looking at if a backhoe goes through a wooden cabin, it's not that hard for you to say, oh, there's the cabin. <laughs> <laughs> but an archaic pit house, if it clips the yeah. edge of it or some kind of activity surface that's charcoal, how do you differentiate that from just normal forest fire? Uh, you know, and, and what do you look for? Groundstone, especially. Groundstone, man, was like a mystery for a long time mm-hmm. for me until many people had shown me how to identify it and, you know, what to be looking for and stuff. So, for me, they had to actually go out, not only show me the pictures of things, which they had photographs, you know, that they had found other stuff in situ that they sent me JPEGs that I could actually look at. But then also for a couple hours, there was someone that was like, don't walk underneath the backhoe's tracks. Don't, you know, don't do this. If you see a thing, this cruise sign for stop digging mm-hmm. is this. If you, you know, we need a few seconds you know, here's the number to the guy who's in charge and they won't listen to you. Just call that guy. They'll say, give him 15 minutes to look at this thing, right? Like don't just jump into an unsecured trench. There was a million different practical things, but then the other things were, here's the kind of constellation of things you look for, for the archaic period in this County. Here's what you look for in this County. Here's, here's what, do you know what a flake looks like? And, And so they went down the list of several different things for about two or three hours And then the guy who was the monitoring person goes, okay, have fun, bye, and just drove away. But I have a feeling if I was completely clueless and didn't know anything, uh, or if I was just saying, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, to every single thing and not really listening, I have a feeling that guy would have stayed longer. Right. And so then, you know, I was let loose to monitor uh, after I'd gotten a bit of training. Uh, They knew that there was no way I'd learn that in college. Uh, And it was just a company, that was a company I worked for. So then moving forward, when I had monitor, if I couldn't make it out to the field, call them on the phone. What you have data, you know, are you connected to this and that? Okay, tonight I want you to do this and I want you to do that. And, you know, talk to them frequently because I know a lot of other folks were just sent out there and then the monitor, they never called in and no one ever knew what they were doing. They could have just been sleeping in the truck and letting the bulldozers roll and not doing anything. (laughs) I, I mean, you, you run the whole gamut from training from a training standpoint for different companies. Uh, and I think the point of bringing it up on this podcast is to just make it make companies aware and, and make people aware that training really needs to be kept up on. Because I, I think the I think the big issue is not just the onboarding, uh, which is really more what you're talking about. You know, hey, you're new on the project. This is what you're looking for. These are the things you could find. And this is what you do if you do find something. But then if it's a longer term monitoring thing, then and, and also if you look at somebody's resume and the last like six things they've done was monitoring, <laughs> then maybe quiz them a little bit and say, hey, do you know what to do in this case? Do you know what to do in this case? Do you know how to use this? Uh, and and maybe just, you know, it, it's not it's not uncouth or um, disrespectful to quiz them on their knowledge of stuff because you're sending them out there as representative of your company and of the archaeological record in that area to actually go out and do a quality job. So I think comp- some of these companies down here in Southern California too, they need to be hyper aware of the fact that they've got people out there that are monitoring for months or years at a time and they need to bring them in for periodic training. There better be room in the budget for that. If there isn't, I don't know what kind of company you're running, but there's got to be room to bring everybody in for one, like uh, in, the Air- in the Air Force and then consequently the Civil Air Patrol, we have what's called a safety down day. The Air Force does it a lot, but we do it once a year in CAP, where it's basically we can talk about nothing else but safety issues that have been brought up throughout the year. And I think having a safety down day for your field techs, where it's basically a company retreat almost at the at the offices, you just bring everybody in, bring in some food and say, hey, let's go over training. Let's just have a, a whole company training day. If it, you know, fits yeah. with your clients, of course, which probably doesn't. I, and I, I don't I don't know. I guess I would just take it a step further of, you know, the obligation and how the individual feels like how the cor- yeah. corporate culture is. You know, do you want to do archaeology or do you want to have people standing next to a backhoe in the desert? Because I'm pretty sure a lot of folks signed up for this because they thought they were going to do archaeology. And the only way we get to do it is to find sites. And the only way you find sites is if you know what you're looking for. It's pretty I, I, I knew that. There were, you know, places where the Northwest was one. They used to always joke, you never find anything there because in Arizona, 
I don't know if monitors are more qualified or whatever, or if it's just easier. You know, when Lewis was on here a couple of weeks ago, I was shaking my head like, yeah, walking through the desert in Arizona, it's not like it's that hard. There's a mound with charcoal in it and shirts sticking out. It looks like it's a prehistoric site. I mean, <laughs> you don't have to be a genius to figure that out. They would always joke about, oh, you never find anything in the Northwest. So the companies I work for, they worked hard on us finding sites. And they, they did all kinds of different things and ended up finding sites of different time periods. But I have a feeling it was the company's culture. They had these questions they wanted to know about the past. And it was up to the people who worked there to help yeah. the supervisors and the PhDs further their research of what they wanted to know about the past. And they knew the only way they were going to do that is by doing projects. And the only way they were going to find things in projects is if the people who were out there knew what they were doing. I think tied to all this is the fact that if you're monitoring for a really long time or you're, you're back-to-back project monitoring, uh, which again, something that is a very real scenario down here in Southern California, if you're back-to-back monitoring, you can get really complacent. You know, you know, Maybe you started out as a really great archaeologist and you're reading the reports and you're reading the site records, but... Man, when you're on your like sixth monitoring gig, three years into it, and you're just like, shit, my Audible subscription is on fire. You know, I'm listening to all these podcasts and you just get to this point where, you know, that's your life and you don't care about it anymore because you know you're not going to find it. Oh, man, that's crummy because also I I I feel that way about artifacts and I I don't mind analyzing (laughs) artifacts, but I hate washing them for some reason. I don't know why. I like finding them, but I just don't like washing and drying artifacts. And so those ones where you find historical, oh, you're the historical archaeologist, so you need to do all the artifact analysis, which means they're going to give you huge, huge sacks of muddy artifacts. I always want them to see them and uh, do all the, you know, analysis and stuff on the computer and, you know, write about them, but I never like washing them. It's the same thing with monitoring. I like (laughs) the sites when you find them. And there's a site there, but watching the backhoe dig uh, after a little while, it's just kind of like brain damaging. I mean, I just, I get yeah. super bored. Yeah. And then a lot of times we don't find anything or if we do find something, it's already all destroyed. So it's not a real site. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And I, you know, I've done quite a bit of monitoring. Same thing yeah. with shovel probes too. You can dig a lot of shovel probes and not find anything. If no one on the crew finds anything for multiple days and you've been digging dozens and dozens of shovel probes that can be really uh, uh disheartening oh it's the same thing with survey you know you're walking miles and miles and miles in the desert and you don't find anything you start your mind starts to wander and you find yourself <laughs> looking up more often <laughs> it's like that part of kung goes. fu where there's the mirages and you're just staggering across the <laughs> yeah. desert or uh i can't remember uh, uh good the bad and the ugly you're just barely yeah. surviving <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to wrap up the discussion on monitoring and come back with some some quality of life stuff. So I'm, I'm just going to leave you guys with this. If you are monitoring right now, listening to this podcast, because that's what you do when you're monitoring is listen to podcasts and other stuff, then, you know, just take a minute to brush up your skills. Maybe ask your company uh, if they can have some training day for all their monitors, you know. Um, and, and know that we're with you. We have monitored yes. before. We have been in your shoes before. We have. I've read many books while monitoring because sometimes, uh, I, I mean, up in Nevada monitoring, it's it was like, okay, we're going to monitor for the first, you know, 20 centimeters of this, but then I've got to be out here while you dig the rest of it and there's nothing there, um, you know, or, or whatever the case may be. So sometimes that's a good point to do some training, but people aren't often told what to train on or given training materials. So, yeah. All right. So we're going to end this right here and come back for segment three and talk about some quality of life issues uh, in relation to a a Facebook post that was out in late March on one of the archaeology groups. We'll talk about that in a minute. Hey, everybody. Chris Webster here to talk about one of our partners, Team Black. That's also something I'm working on. And I've got two asks for you. One is that you go over there and you watch all the videos. That'd be great because we all learn stuff and as career monitors or people that are monitoring a lot or maybe you're rusty out the field season um, you can go check out some of those videos we've got a growing list of videos and as you're hearing this i'm actually recording some more uh the day this releases and and putting those out this evening so uh check those out over at arccert.black when you get there head over to the arccert videos and you can see arc level one two and three and we've got a bunch of videos there now those are just images with the descriptions they link to our Patreon page where you can, instead of paying for these videos one at a time, which didn't seem very fitting um, or cost effective, you can join at a level, you know, from $3 to $25 a month. 
And at each level, you get all the levels below it. So if you join at the $25 level, you get everything. But if you join at the $10 level, you also get 7 and 3 or whatever. So check that out at arccert.black. That's arccert.black for all your training needs. And we're looking for instructors. That's the second ask. So if you're an expert, let me know. Hey, Chris Webster, jump in one last time. You head on over to arcpodnet dot com slash side hustle that's dot com slash side hustle if you're monitoring right now or you're doing anything else it's early days early in the season you depleted all your winter resources then head on over and check that out it's a it's a course again it's not free but you got to spend money to make money uh, it actually is a learning course. It's taught by a friend of mine, Mr. Seth Himes. He's not an archaeologist. He's a digital marketing professional. And this course has helped lots and lots of people. Uh, I follow him on Facebook, and he's always putting up pictures of people thanking him for getting them out of a you know crazy job that they were in. And and now they're making sixty to $100,000 a year in a new career. Now, you don't want to get out of archaeology. I understand that. But, well, maybe you do. But you can get clients, and these are digital marketing clients, so you can get clients and work them from a hotel room in the middle of nowhere in Nevada. As long as you've got an internet connection, uh, maybe some phone service, you can set some up for your clients, but you got to know how to do it. And this is where the side hustle comes in. And if you plan on starting your own business, or maybe you're running something on the side, this will help you with your own digital marketing efforts. So um, I believe it's... Uh, somewhere around a hundred dollars a month or something like that to join this course and and you watch all the videos if you want in one month and then cancel it if you want to or you can uh, take a little while and you can uh, use their support and their forums and and talk to Seth directly through those and uh, and get all that support so head on over to arcpodnet.com forward slash side hustle learn a new career learn something uh, that you can do in your off time and a little bit of that goes right back to the APN and you're supporting archaeological education and outreach at the same time. All right, now back to the show. Welcome back to episode 162 of the Sierra Archaeology Podcast. And we are pivoting from monitoring into quality of life issues, but maybe it's not that hard of a pivot because, man, you're... Your quality of life can really go downhill sometimes. <laughs> you feel like this is what I signed up for. This is what I got a degree for. But then some people might actually love it and say, "Wow, I like actually not doing anything and sitting in the truck and reading all day." This is Chris, my dream job. Chris, yeah. Some people like podcasts. <laughs> I mean, I feel like monitoring is our bread and butter <laughs> for podcast listeners. So uh, I don't, uh, I don't begrudge them at all. However. Um, uh, there was a recent post in the Archeo Field Text group on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, uh, you can probably find it. Um, I'm not going to call anybody out. It's a closed group. So go over there if you want to come in and and check it out. But um, it was basically a person talking about, uh, and Bill, chime in at any time because I think you're a little more familiar with this than I am. Sure. But there was basically a person talking about rampant drug abuse, alcoholism, which we all know is the case <laughs> in, in archaeology. Uh, and, and then that tied to quality of life issues and then in conversely tied to like suicide and things yeah. like that. You know, she said she'd known what three, four people or, or this person knew three or four people that, that, uh, had committed suicide. I don't know if it's a man or a woman uh. and, you know, died in a hotel room alone. And that just, that just really sucks. But that brings up so many issues, not only what circumstances brought this person to that point and could the field as a whole have produced some resources or support systems to, overcome that or to help this individual or these individuals and then also just what what can be done about the people that were on that crew was any thought yeah. given to grief counseling the people that were on that crew that knew this person that woke up and somebody went and knocked on their door and you know either went in or got the person to open the hotel room door and when they couldn't get a hold of them and mm -hmm. you know there it is you know where's where's the grief counseling for all that and, and i'm not saying none of that was done i don't know but just knowing how cheap CRM is, my guess is people were just moved on and yeah. and, and no second thought was given to it. So what, what other stuff have you pulled from this? Yeah, well, the, the number one thing that I pulled from it is that I, I seriously have no idea how to deal with, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. if you look at the, if you look at the thread, first of all, it, it's coming on the, the tips or the, the, the tip of a long thing that I've seen for the last couple of years of folks actually trying to acknowledge and uh, discuss the problem that archaeology has with, you know, drug abuse, uh, mental health issues, which I, I am fully unequipped to deal with, right? And then mm -hmm. the fact that when someone dies on the crew, that's something that's, you know, not even mentioned, right? So we get all these trainings, as we were just talking about, and even if we went further and had our home monitoring training, where's the training that addresses, you know, the, the fact that 
uh, you know, you finished your degree and did everything right. And that you're stuck watching a backhoe in, uh, LA County in the desert, mm-hmm. right? Like w- that's definitely far from the, re- the, you know, dream that you had of excavating exotic sites in Greece and traveling around the world doing archaeology. And if, especially if you did do a field school that was in Belize or, you know, Europe or something like that, or Africa, you got a taste of that exotic archaeology lifestyle. Yet here you are years later standing there, you know, watching a backhoe. So that just already is a huge disconnect. No one ever even mentioned that that was a possibility that was going to happen after college for many other people. But then add to it the fact that you're not always at home and that you're moving all over the country all the time. Uh, and you know, you don't really actually have a steady place and that you live in a hotel room, right? So mm-hmm. that that's a whole different thing. Then yeah. m- add the multiplier of a bunch of people drinking constantly. And we all know if you're listening to this and, and you're doing archaeology, you know, uh, if you didn't know, archaeologists drink a lot of alcohol, right? But what I'm seeing in these posts is that it's being mixed with other stuff too, where there's a lot of folks who are using drugs that may be legal or illegal or whatever, depending on where you're at, right? So marijuana, which is legal in a lot of different places, then prescription medicines that might in fact be prescribed to deal with the depression or the issues of being, you know, out in the field. If someone has been pursuing psychological help, they could actually be on antidepressants and then they use alcohol and then they're in a situation that's just repeating the system, it creates a kind of environment that I actually never even really thought about before. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because when I was actually in it, I noticed there's a lot of people drinking, you know, at high levels. And uh, that was kind of like normalized, right? So uh, in the beginning, it seems like everyone in their 20s or whatever is just treating, we've talked about it before, treating it like every single time a spring break. You're staying in a hotel, you're not at home, you get free breakfast, you're digging in dirt all the time and then you come back and people are just, you know, wild and out all the time. We've, we've mentioned that before, but yeah. at, a, at a certain point, you know, after f- four or five years, a lot of folks that ends up being, you know, not, that's not really the thing anymore. Right. So getting all crazy and having, you know, these crazy bar nights and digging off your hangover the next day over time, that kind of actually ends up being not really a thing. So now what I'm realizing is that, folks are kind of just sitting in their hotel room drinking alone, <laughs> yeah. which I, I don't know what's worse. I don't know if it's worse to think it's spring break every 10 day session or to sit in there watching cable, uh, drinking a, a 12 pack every single night or however much you're drinking. Right. Cause also hard alcohol use too. And archeologists definitely discuss, you know, how much we drink and all this stuff. I, I don't know. I never thought about whether this was actually, a year round thing, right? If the conference was just a one-time thing or if this is a daily occurrence that people are drinking at conference levels all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm finding out is some people are doing that. Now at our age too, we're starting to hear about individuals dying from, you know, depression combined with, you know, not having adequate uh, support, mental health system, not having, uh, you know, proper health insurance, being a temp worker for 20 something different years, you know, uh, it adds up. And what the post was mentioning is that folks are dying from uh, illnesses, which I know a couple of people who have died from illnesses that were field techs that have been doing it for 20 something years. And then reading the post and putting it all together that, yeah, they probably had pretty bad depression problem that was being even exacerbated by using alcohol and then made even worse by the fact that they're still a field tech moving all over the place that the, you know, the illnesses build up, organs start to fail uh, the depression builds up, and now I'm starting to hear that there's a lot of folks who are doing, or, or that it's an occasional occurrence of suicide, and mm-hmm. that folks are dying in the field, right? Dying at the hotel room, and, and also the fact that this isn't the first time since the podcast has started that I've heard of an archaeologist killing himself or dying from an Ill, a, a preventable illness, an alcohol or substance abuse related illness. Mm-hmm. And we've been doing the podcast for six years, and the fact that. Before that, I already knew people who were dying. And then since we've done that, now people are starting to talk. And I'm I'm realizing that my my experience is not unique. This is a thing that's happening. Well, one one note I'd like to make, uh, just because you mentioned it about marijuana, is that while it is legal in a lot of states now, 
And in some states, it's legal for medical marijuana. It's still like other prescribed drugs, uh, if, if you've got it as a medical use or whatever, still not legal or able to be used while you're at work. You know, just like, you know, alcohol is legal, but that doesn't mean you can yeah. crap up, crack open a bottle of bourbon at lunch. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> so it's, so keep that in mind. I think a lot of people think they've been given like the golden ticket with marijuana and they can just like smoke it up whenever they want because it's legal. But that's not actually the case. It's still a drug. You well, know, it's and, not- and also in some places uh, you get drug tested anyway. And because it's against the law at the federal level, for example, yeah. mines, which I've told a lot of people, yeah, even yeah. Cal- mines in California. You know, I worked at a mine in California that gave me a breathalyzer and a, a urinalysis. And I was kind of like, wow, that's crazy. But then, you know, there was folks sitting out in front of the office waiting for their work truck to finish that day so they could go back to home probably to get fired because they didn't mm-hmm. pass their uh, UA or a breathalyzer. So they showed up yeah. to work with so much alcohol still on their breath when they started work that they ended up being unfit for work. And I also have heard of other crews who go to mines and they, you know, the policy at the mine is different than the policy of the company. So the company would say that they have a random drug test and then like most archaeology companies not actually in fact do it. But the mine would give random UAs whenever they wanted for anyone who was working on their property. And these folks decided that they were going to have to just go home because they didn't have enough people who would pass the urinalysis. So they, they had to yeah. just not work. I can only imagine what happened to those folks when they got back home, when the company found out that there wasn't enough people to actually do the work. Because if they did the random drug test that they were all supposed to do that morning, half mm-hmm. the crew wasn't going to pass. Yeah. So, you know, it could be legal, but it's still in a gray area and it is not a free for all. But also the level that we're talking about, too, of people drinking so much alcohol that when they get there in the morning, they don't pass a breathalyzer. Uh, right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bad deal. Exactly. That's yeah. very bad. That's bad. And yeah. if there's people on your crew. So imagine that you have five individuals. And you're supposed to go to a mine and they are all clean for marijuana, but uh, two of them have drank so much the night before that they don't pass the UA. What are you going to mm-hmm. do? You, you have part of a crew. You can't really leave two people just sitting in the desert. Uh, and also yeah. you can't really functionally get your job done. Yeah. And we've got to look at, you know, tying all this back to quality of life and, and mental health is we've got to tie all this back because like, let's say, for example, I'm on a three week project right now. Uh, all but one of the people are new to me, right? I've never met them before. Um, one guy, I, you know, recommended him for this job. So he's down here with me, Richie, who's been on some of the other podcasts before. And he's on this with me. But aside from that, I didn't know any of the other people. So as so often is the case with with CRM projects, if you've got a, uh, a short term project like that, there's almost no real... I mean, there are social consequences because this field is really small. You'll probably see people again. But that being said, I've been doing this over 10 years and I've never met these guys. So uh, I never heard of them or anything like that. So there are still new people in the field. While we say it is really small, there still is tens of, you know, over 10,000 people <laughs> that claim to be archaeologists that are maybe not all working right now, but that are, that are here. The point is, in such a short period of time, where is the consequence to me, you know, getting drunk and, and showing up the next morning and, uh, you know, being whatever, uh, you know, being belligerent and, and doing whatever I'm going to do as a, as a drunk person, I might get fired or I might leave in two and a half weeks or either way, I'm never going to see him again. Right. That's kind of my thought or I'm, I'm, par- I'm pretending to be somebody else here. Obviously that is my thought directly. But anyway, um, the point is there's no real, consequence to that other than maybe you won't work for that company, but there's other companies. Maybe you won't work with those people, but there's other people. And so it's like you're always on vacation or always on spring break or something like that. And there's never any lasting consequences until you've been doing this long enough to have burned literally every single bridge. (laughs) But that does take a long time and you may be dead by then. Yeah. But well, so that's exactly there are consequences. If you drink alcohol extensively, it's not like we don't know what happens. I mean, organ failure, all kinds of different things, right? Yeah. And then depression too. So if you mix this whole thing together and you keep acting like a spring break every single day for 20 something years, you're going to be in a bad state and it's not like it's going to be easy to get out of it, right? Alcoholism is not a, something to joke about and that, uh, you know, it's difficult for people to break. It's difficult mm-hmm. for people to move on and try to uh, rebuild or whatever. And, and it is a, a, a very real aspect of American life. Well, yeah. And and back to mental health, the, the reason for, for me saying all that is basically 
you know, let, let's say you guys, the, the, the crew does have a rager one night or, uh, you know, maybe somebody just has one by themselves and they show up in the morning drunk and the crew chief or the field director, or whoever is in charge of that person finds out in the morning. The last thing you want to do is call them out in front of everybody, make fun of it, laugh and say and do all those sorts of things. The very last thing you want to do is actually let them work that day. Um, there yeah. needs to be consequences and there's also safety issues. So they need to go back to their hotel room. But if I sensed or smelled that somebody was drunk, I pull them aside and say, listen, I know that you're, I can smell alcohol on your breath right now. I don't know when the last time you drank was, but I, I can smell alcohol in your breath and you're going to stay home today. I'm going to tell the crew you're sick, that you're not feeling well, but you're staying home today. If you call them out in front of everybody and say, oh, look at that drunk. By the time they sober up, they're going to feel so shitty about themselves and not want to be in front of everybody else. And, and maybe they're cool. Maybe they're going to pass it off, you know, and, and whatever. But over time, that kind of negative, I guess, reinforcement is just going to build up and build up and build up. And it's not going to be good for their overall quality of life. And they're going to find themselves in the midst of a deep depression at some point if they are not already there. Yeah. yeah. And then also, you know, building upon that, too, the very worst situation is when everybody is pulling ragers every night and waking yeah. up every single morning destroyed and, and yeah. uh, everybody is unfit for duty and everybody is, has a hangover and uh, they just treat it like it's, you know, part of being on the crew. You find that on camping projects a lot when there's uh, not a lot else to do after work. Yeah. You know, you don't want to go on a hike because you spent your whole day hiking. It, yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I, and so my, my, com, the, the thing that, strikes me is that I'm just so unprepared for all of this stuff. Right. I'm, I'm yeah. also death in the field too, which is a aspect. And I've heard, you know, stories of individuals who pass away in their hotel room. And then the company mm -hmm. is trying to put together some kind of system uh, to deal with the unfortunate and also catastrophic act of someone who is, you know, one of the working in, in both cases, they were, they had families, they had people who were relying on them that they, you know, had health issues because of their age or whatever. And I don't know if they were related to archaeology or not. Um, and they ended up dying at the hotel room and the company has to put together a policy or a system or whatever is going to happen right then to, you know, I mean, respectfully help the deceased family get the body so that they can have the body in turn properly according to whatever their tradition or what their belief is. Right. Mm -hmm. But then also, the situation of crew who have been on a crew that somebody died, uh, there's not really a death clause in the contract, right? So going out to work is kind of not a thing, but then, you know, it has to be a thing. And, mm -hmm. and what kind of counseling is going to be put together for individuals who have experienced that, right? In, in yeah. my experience on the working on the border in Arizona, it was, I worked for a couple different companies, right? And we worked in those areas where there are individuals who have passed away, right? And also high traffic areas for uh, immigration uh, to the United States without actually going to the immigration office, right? So some would say it's illegal. I would just say it's people being human beings. Um, and so unfortunately, they pass across the most remote and desolate parts of Arizona. And I'd see the, the stuff that was there. And people I'd worked with have found bodies out there, right? So we, by law, we have protocol of what we're supposed to do when we find a body in the desert, right? Contact the county coroner, contact your company, tell them that you found a body and everything, right? But the the psychological effect of individuals who have been around a body, the, I don't think there's really a mechanism for that. There's not, no. there, your company does not have grief counseling. Uh, there is not a, you know, work stoppage for people to get evaluated for their psychological condition. And, and I can tell no. you that I have not actually seen a corpse while I was, you know, working out there, I have worked with many people who have found individuals and in their their bodies out there in the desert. But I can tell you now, none of the companies had any kind of grief counseling system set up for people who had encountered mm -hmm. that situation. No, and and especially when you're dealing with issues like, you know, for example, down here on the border, it's a. Uh, there's a lot more wrapped up in it, right? So if you find something like that, and even if it's not like a, a body, body, but maybe just bones, you know, um, remains that have been out there for long, I mean, it doesn't take long in the desert for all the fleshy material to be gone. Uh, so it could be still relatively recent, but the point is, you know, it's not prehistoric and you know, it's not historic. I mean, just looking at the surroundings and looking at the circumstance, sure. I mean, you know that this is somebody who 
tried to come across the border and failed for one reason or another and then died out there. And there's so much more emotional charged energy wrapped up in that statement and wrapped up in the political environment down here and, and wrapped up in these people's circumstances that, you know, I've seen lots and lots of human remains on projects. My, one of my very first projects was six months of digging up human remains, but these were eight to 10,000 years old. It was easier to see them as disconnected from human beings. I hate to say that at first it wasn't, but then it became easier. Right. And then now they were just artifacts and they were things I was recording and things you're putting in a bag and, and just dealing with it. Right. But then when you see something in an area that is so emotionally charged for one, no matter what your political views, it's, a, it's an emotionally charging situation. And, you know, companies probably don't have something set up, you know, to deal with the crew that is now going home at the end of the day or going home on the weekend or whatever. And, and just thinking about this constantly and saying, man, you know, what, how am I going to deal with this myself mentally? And then all the other stuff they've got going on in their lives are also piling on. And then you've got this to think about. And it's just like, you need some kind of acknowledgement. If you're running a company right now, you need to at least, I would have the company owner. If you don't have any sort of counselors, maybe you can't afford it. I would have the company owner call each person individually after work yeah. and just have a quick discussion with them and say, Hey, you know, thanks for being professionals out there. Um, I'm here. If you, you want to talk about anything, are you okay with this? Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're probably going to say, okay, but even just having the phone call you're not gonna be okay. is an acknowledgement. You're not going to be, okay. be okay. But having that phone call, knowing that somebody is at least concerned with your mental health and caring, I think would be at least a little bit in the positive side of that person's brain. Even if they're having a difficult time dealing with it, I think that would be just a, an acknowledgement that, hey, we understand you saw some shit today and we're here for you if you need it. You know? Yeah. So I think that story about human remains and them being thousands of years old is what Native Americans have been telling us for a long time. <laughs> right. We, yeah. we never get it until it's our own people or someone who's closer to us. You're totally right. I mean, it's yeah. sad, but that's, I think they've been yeah. telling us for decades that this is what's up. Yeah. They have such a much closer connection with their, with their ancestors, regardless of age than, than we do, yeah. you know? So, all right. Well, I think that's enough for today. Um, I, I'll tell you what, anybody listening to this that is having some issues. I mean, I'm not a mental health counselor. Bill is not a mental health counselor. <laughs> Steven is not a mental health counselor, but we've all been in this field for a really long time. And our contact info uh, via either Twitter or, in my case, Twitter and email are on the uh, show notes for this page and, and every page. And you can also have the contact information. So if you just want somebody to, you know, if even if you don't want a response, you'll get a response. But even if you don't want one, you just want somebody to vent to or to say something to. Uh, I know my door is always open for that. Yeah. and. And I'm sure the other guys are too. So Yeah. And also, if you have any information that can help us with this, if you know of counseling or any kind of resources, yeah. I mean, it's pretty apparent that others don't. And I know I personally don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so if if you know anything, please contact us and tell it, lead us in the right direction so we can figure out what how to help other people. Yeah. And, and bigger companies out there, more than likely through your HR department, have something already set up. You may just not be aware of it, but they're you know, these big engineering firms, they, they have to have stuff to deal with that. Like, for example, I mentioned I'm in the Civil Air Patrol before. I'm a squadron commander. I've had training on how to write basically not an obituary, but basically a note to the whole squadron about somebody that has passed, right? Uh, I've been trained on how to write that note and how to, what to say and what not to say and pull in different things and stuff like that. But people don't get that training. People don't get that training on how to deal with this kind of stuff and uh, at the smaller companies and the lower levels. So we need to we need to all be there for each other in the end. All right. Well, thanks guys. And uh, we'll be back next week. All right, see you next time. That's it for another episode of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archpodnet.com slash podcast. Please comment and share anywhere you see the show. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or just email chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Support the show and the network at archpodnet.com slash members. Get some swag and extra content while you're there. Send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. Thanks to everyone for joining me this week. Thanks also to the listeners for tuning in, and we'll see you in the field. Goodbye. Take it easy. Bye. 
Uh, bye. My name is Doug. Yeah, I was going to say no, Doug, so... I for... <laughs> We're Doug proxies. <laughs> One. this show is produced and recorded by the archaeology podcast network chris webster and tristan boyle in reno nevada at the reno collective this has been a presentation of the archaeology podcast network visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.